All right, today I want to summarize what's in Chapter 7 on ionic bonding and the, the first section of Chapter 8 on covalent bonding. Because again, we're going through this fairly quickly, and so there's some material here I'm not going to hold you responsible for. I just want to compress it down and give you the high points. And then tomorrow we'll pick up with the second section of Chapter 8, and um, then we'll be back on track to finish out the year with that chapter. Um, so again, this slide is from a PowerPoint I did in previous years from a different textbook, but um, it kind of summarizes what I want to start with looking at here. And that is the properties of ionic compounds versus covalent compounds. Okay, If you have a compound that's made with ionic bonds, like sodium chloride, table salt, that compound is going to tend to be solid. Okay, They have very, very high melting and boiling points. If you want to take table salt and melt it, now not just dissolve it in water, but actually physically melt it, you have to heat it up until like maybe 2,000 degrees Celsius. Um, at that point, it's glowing red hot molten salt. It's almost like lava at that point. So, so ionic substances tend to be solids at room temperature. And if you want to actually make them liquids, you need ridiculous temperatures to do it. Uh, the reason why for that is it has very, very strong intermolecular forces, strong forces holding the ions together, which we're going to look at in, in a moment. Okay, um, com Compounds that are covalently bonded, held together by sharing electrons. Um, water molecules are a good example of that. Um, carbon dioxide molecules, even oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere are all good examples of that where, where they share electrons and form covalent bonds. Um, those compounds, you'll notice, tend to be liquids or gases at room temperature. Uh, another way to say that is they have fairly low melting and boiling points. Um, water's melting point is, what, zero degrees Celsius, right? Whereas salts is 2,000 degrees Celsius. Um, by the way, um, water is a polar covalent compound, so its melting point is actually fairly high for a covalent compound. Most covalent compounds are even, even lower, and they tend to be gases. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide are good examples of that. Okay, uh, and Those are nonpolar covalent compounds. Um, ionic compounds have very high densities. The ions are packed real tightly together. Covalent compounds, even when they're solids, tend to be low density. Um, think of ice crystals, you know, frozen water, um, much less dense than salt crystals. OK, um, oxygen ice is even less dense yet because it's a nonpolar covalent. Notice the polar covalents kind of are in between the two. Um, ionic compounds tend to be soluble in water. And the reason why we looked at earlier in the year um, when we could actually see each other, um, and that's because water molecules have negative and positive ends to them. Now we can use the correct term. Water molecules are polar covalent compounds. And so the negative side of the water molecule can grab onto positive ions and vice versa. Um, covalent compounds, now if they're polar covalent, they can be soluble in water. Alcohols are a good example of that. Ammonia is a good example of that. Um, but if they're nonpolar covalent, they're often insoluble in water. Wax is a nonpolar covalent compound, and it doesn't dissolve in water at all. Oil is nonpolar covalent. Gasoline is nonpolar. Um, Nitrogen and oxygen in the air are nonpolar, and they have very, very poor solubility in water. There's no charges for water to grab onto. Ionic compounds tend to be good conductors, at least if they're in a liquid state, because there's charges that are free to move around and conduct electricity. Covalent compounds are poor conductors because even if they're, they're polar covalent, the charges are locked within a molecule. And so they're not free to move one way or another and actually conduct electricity. So um, let's look at the actual structures of these compounds, which I'm going to do um, in my own artistic way. Um, and, and then it will help explain those properties. Um, OK, so first of all, when you have an ionic compound, let's take a sodium with one electron, a chlorine with seven electrons, i going to make my dots bigger, I guess. Oops, making it worse. Um, so again, the chlorine is just short one electron in its valent shell right here. And so it says, hey, sodium, give me your electron. 
maybe they at first try to share, but as we saw yesterday, the electronegativity difference is so large that the electron just ends up being taken away. If sodium had a larger electronegativity, perhaps it would have held on to the electron and they would have to share instead. But since sodium's electronegativity is so ridiculously small, chlorine just takes the electron away and sodium is, just doesn't have it. So now what we have is a sodium plus ion and a chloride with all seven dots around it, or all eight dots around it, negative ion. Now, here's the thing. Here's a sodium plus, there's a chloride minus. But there's more in the beaker. There's another sodium plus and another chloride minus and so on and so on and so on. And, whoops, my ions are getting really badly sized here. The negatives should be bigger. Um, notice they're all sticking together. This sodium in the middle here, it's positively charged. Maybe I can make that positive a little better. Maybe I can't. <laughs> It's positively charged, and so it's attracting all these negatives around it, including also two, you know, one in front and one behind that we can't see. So which chlorine did it give its electron to? Which one does it belong to in a sense? Well, it really doesn't matter. So I don't know, maybe it gave it to this one. doesn't matter. It has a negative charge. The sodium has a positive charge. And so now that sodium has a positive charge, it's going to attract every negative anywhere nearby. So this chlorine got its electron from who knows, maybe that sodium, doesn't matter. It's negative, it attracts all the sodiums around it. So once you've made your ions plus and minus charges, they're done with each other. They couldn't care less what happens. They got their stable electron configuration now. But since they have opposite charges, they stick together and they stick to all the opposite charges, not just the one they happen to give their electron to. Net result is ionic compounds form this rigid crystal lattice of alternating plus minus charges. Notice it's rigid because if I take one of these, where's my cursor? There it is. Take one of these negative charges and move it down too far, it's next to another negative and the whole thing flies apart. So the positives and negatives hold each other in place, making a very, very rigid crystal. And since it's actual bonds holding the crystal together, ionic bonds, um, the, um, the crystal is held very tightly and so it's very high density. If you want to melt this, you've got to pull these ions apart from each other. In other words, you've got to break the bonds. And that's going to take a lot of energy. And so therefore, um, it, it has a very, very high melting and boiling point. So you see how understanding the structure we have here allows us to explain why they're solid at room temperature. The ions stick together. Why it has such a high melting and boiling point? Because you got to break the ionic bonds to, to pull them apart. Why it's soluble in water, you have charges. Why it's dense, because they get pulled tightly together by those strong forces. So that's ionic compounds. What about covalent compounds? Well, again, in that case, they shared electrons. There's this shared pair right in the middle there an electron cloud surrounding the whole works, right? So now you have a molecule. Now, over here, maybe there's another molecule. But here's the important thing. This chlorine has nothing to do with that chlorine over there. This chlorine belongs to that chlorine right there. It forms an actual bond with it, and it forms an actual molecule. Back with my ionic compound up here, there's no such thing as, an, as a molecule of this. The chlorine doesn't belong to any particular sodium. My neighbor picks this point to start making noise out in the yard with some kind of power tools. I don't know what they are, but I don't know if you can hear it or not, but I can. Um, so anyway, there's no molecule of ionic compounds. They're just jumbled ions held together by ionic charges. But with a molecular compound, there is individual molecules. So yes, this chlorine is bound very tightly to that chlorine, and it's going to be hard to break that molecule apart. But this molecule really has very little to do with that molecule over there, or the next molecule over here, or the next one over there. So these molecules just freely float around. If they come near each other, they tend to just bump off each other. And so the net result is 
um, it doesn't stick together real well and it doesn't form a solid real easily. Um, so these things tend to just float around randomly bumping off each other or being gases. Um, now, uh, when I say they don't attract each other, I really should say they don't attract each other much. The, the protons in this nucleus will still attract that electron cloud there. So there are some little weak forces between the two molecules. But those forces are much, much weaker than the full out ionic bonds we saw just previously. So these so-called intermolecular forces, forces between the molecules, are very, very weak and they're easy to break. So you're down near absolute zero, yeah, they're going to stick together and be a solid. But you warm it up a little bit and you've already broken those forces down and it, it becomes a liquid or even a gas. So notice again, these covalent compounds tend to be liquids or gases at room temperature. They tend to have rather low melting points because it's easy to break those weak attractions apart. They're very low density because again, there's not much holding them together. Even when you do liquefy or solidify them, there's not much force pulling them in tight so they don't stick tightly together. They just float loosely together. And so they're much lower density. Again, you can see why we as chemists care about all these theories of bonding and electron clouds and all that stuff, because these theories allow us to explain real world properties. Chlorine is a gas at room temperature, not a solid. Salt is a solid, not a gas. Chlorine, if you do freeze it down near absolute zero somewhere, it's a very soft ice and a very low density ice. All those things are easily explainable in terms of the attraction forces between molecules or ions. Now, what if you had polar molecules? Okay, molecules that are positive side and a negative side. Now, yeah, the molecule, you know, the atom in the molecule has nothing to do with that atom in that molecule. So they still have these fairly weak intermolecular forces. But now you get negative and positive charges that do kind of attract each other better than just up here. So polar covalent molecules tend to be a halfway step between ionic and regular covalent. They tend to be better soluble in water. They tend to be more dense. They tend to have higher melting and boiling points. Not nearly as high as ionic, obviously, but you get the idea. Um, so, again, from yesterday, electronegativity difference is driving all this. We now know how ionic bonds form by a transfer of electrons, and we know the properties of ionic and covalent, even polar and nonpolar covalent compounds. Uh, I think that'll do it for today. It's a little bit shorter than the average lesson today, but we'll be okay with that. Tomorrow, we'll get back into, we're done with ionic now. We're going to get, for the rest of the year, talk about covalent bonding and these molecules that come out of it. We, there's so much information we can get about these molecules just based on understanding covalent bonding. But that's tomorrow's lesson, and I'll see you then.